Welcome back. Our next panel discussion is women in leadership, and our moderator for this panel is Rear Admiral Luis del Carpio, Peruvian Navy. The Admiral is director of the Peruvian Naval uh, at the director of the Peruvian Naval War College. He graduated from the Peruvian Naval Academy in 1992, and he, he's qualified in submarines and a graduate of the Naval War College's basic staff and command course, and the Navy Command Staff College class of 2015. He holds a master's degree in international relations from Salve Regina University and has served as the commander of several Peruvian submarine forces. Without further ado, let's welcome our panel. Yeah, thank you very much for, for your, the presentation. And also, it's a pleasure to be here back in Newport. Thank you for the kindly invitation, Admiral Chatfield and Dr. Sari Amin. So we, we are here together to talk about women in leadership. The Peruvian Navy also make efforts in also to provide to the young people the concepts because we were talking about culture. The previous, the previous uh, panel, we talked about we, we need to change the culture. The young people are the key factor in that, in that way. So the Peruvian Navy organized since 10 years ago symposiums for young lieutenants. The last year we hosted in Lima the Young Women's Symposium for young lieutenants. We invite uh, two lieutenants from each country from America, including, including two from Germany and Italy last year. And I had the privilege to have as a speaker, Dr. Sarah Yamin and Major General O'Brien. So thank you very much for your support. This year we are here and I had the pleasure to have in this panel wonderful ladies that they achieve the most rank in their our countries, but not also for make a big contribution for their own armed forces, but also to provide security for the entire world. I think that this is the, the key factor to understand. The previous panel also talked about leadership and mentorship. It's very important to have uh, mentors in our careers. That is the reason that we have master chiefs that maintain the culture inside the ship, inside the Navy. Also, we as young officers began to follow path and follow mentors. So we don't have in Peru female admirals, not yet. The, our most rank is right now commanders. And that is the reason that every female symposium, we, we search around the world some leaders to change, to exchange experiences in our symposium. So that is the reason that, for example, in the past we had Admiral Nora Tyson. She was in Lima sharing the, the experiences and all the challenges that she had in the past. So this year we are here and I had the pleasure to present Lieutenant General Nigar Yohar from the Pakistan Army, Brigadier General Patsila from the Royal Malaysian Air Force, and Major General Maureen O'Brien, Irish Army from the United Nations. So we will start today with the presentation of Lieutenant General Nigar Yohar. Please. Thank you very much. Um... Madam President, faculty, students, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and good morning. I feel honored and privileged to be standing here today and sitting here today in front of such august audience and uh, uh, for this uh, WPS that you have organized. And so my gratitude is to, the, to Madam President, to the chair and to all the organizers for having us here. So um, I have to uh, do justice with the huge topics of my story, my experiences, my impact, and my perspective on WPS in a very short time. So I'll try to do that. Uh, my story is a story of struggles and hard work. And it was both on the personal and the professional fronts, uh, but it was well rewarded. I was born in a village, uh, in a traditional Pathan Yusuf Zai family. 
And my uh, problems and struggles started at the very start when I was trying to convince my affectionate but uh, overprotective father to join what he said was the hardships of medical education and military career. So that is how I started. And but uh, with the, with time. Uh, things better. But on the personal front, I did had hardships and that started with the soon that I lost my hero, my father and the unsung hero of my family, my mother and two sisters in a road traffic accident. And after that, the gap was partially filled by my supporting and caring husband. But later in the years, I lost him too. But my work that gave me strength and kept me going. So I worked and worked hard, and that is how I I am here. So the the with passion and with consistent hard work, I proved myself to cross the unseen barrier and the hurdles of the the profession. And I grew in ranks, attaining many first female roles, including the first female commanding officer of a military unit in 75 years of establishment of my country. So the, when I got uh, uh, posted as the commanding officer, one of the men asked me, how are you going to command? He was another commander senior to me. And how are you going to command? And I said, the way that you command. So that is how I started. So uh, then later on, I'm being shot because of the so many things. So uh, later on, uh, I am, uh, I, I, uh, with, yes, my mentors were men and they supported me and they helped me in my profession also. And then, uh, with years, I, in, it was in 2020 and I, my gratitude is to the whole of the nation that celebrated my promotion to the rank of Lieutenant General and then my appointment as the Senate General of Armed Forces of the Military, Navy and Air Force. So I'm my gratitude to them. My shortest message of my story is, if I can, any woman can. So uh, talking about my experiences, my experiences, the list is long, but I will just narrate too short because of the short time as a captain. I was working in cardiology, being a doctor, I, um, that was my passion. And I was doing everything, putting in pacemakers, angiographies, whatever is, was required. But as a woman, I was not allowed to appear in the exam because that was not allowed for the females. So uh, uh, with time and with years, although I could not become a cardiologist, by, uh, but my voice and my work continued for other females. And now we have females in all the specialties, about more than 30 specialties in my military. So uh, another uh, small, I'm, uh, I'm trying to be brief, uh, another small experience, but a little funny one. I was, uh, there was a firing competition for the leaders. So being in a leadership position, I also wanted to go to that competition. So I went to a, the competition and they were surprised that a doctor is coming for the competition of firing. And there, there was a huge slogan and the slogan read, let the best man win. So I was really offended, but then I won and they removed the slogan. <laughs> the list of impacts, if I talk of, is exhaustive, but yes, the women leaders and the women uh, uh, and the leaders, they do make an impression and they are role models and they do make a difference. So after me, more women are coming and are inducted in the military. More are part of different arms. More are included in foreign assignments and in UN missions. More are appointed at the leadership positions. There are many more now in the commanding positions. And my pride, four women have been promoted as major generals and are working wonders. So on the civilian side also, if I be brief, the impact is huge. If I talk of my area and my village from where I belong, the women education has increased significantly with many in higher education and with even an establishment of Nagar Nursing College in my area. As part of national organization like PMDC, CPSP, NCOC, NIH, and many others, my voice is a woman voice in policy making for the woman. So I summarize and I tell the young ladies that hard work works, but don't blame men, engage men. 
for it is not about the gender rivalship it is about the gender partnership and global partnership to accomplish global peace and security so ending the story i will now go to my perspectives on a women peace and security in pakistan yes like the chair uh, uh saira yamin yesterday said that sustainable peace and security is only possible when there is no discrimination on the basis of gender and i totally agree Pakistan is the world's fifth most populous country of the world and in our huge population with diverse socio-economic and cultural composition of the society there are certainly many challenges and with no one size fit all solution however i want to make one thing clear and the clear is the state policy on this the subject the state policy is very clear that the rights of women are the rights of citizens of pakistan and are part of our constitution so in recent years the focus of the government is much more on this and irrespective of the government in the power there is remarkable development in pro women legislation and policy and i'll just name few like domestic violence against women act protection against harassment of women at workplace act criminal law act for women national policy for development and empowerment of women national gender policy framework 22 2022 the government of pakistan recently in its national security policy in the january of 22 26 has recognized gender security as the key pillar on national security and talking of the women generally yes we have progressed and we have a lot to celebrate being one of the sixth largest and the longest contributor including women force to the united nation peacekeeping force with the largest number of women in armed forces in the muslim countries having two time female head of the state prime minister having so many notable women in ministries and ambassadors including one to the united states having a, 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 a judge of the supreme court and so many more the good change is visible with more women in medicine with women in engineering law and everywhere and i am thankful to the government focus and also to the assistance by this country and by other countries and the civil society and the national and international organizations for helping us do this however the gender inequality persists like most of the countries and the countries that claim gender parity even they do not have gender parity at the leadership positions there is a list of challenges and opportunities but i will talk of very few in my country the number one as we were talking since yesterday like captain almanti saira and everybody was saying that are the cultural barriers so the cultural barriers need to be changed in especially in the vulnerable and marginalized groups of society they have to be dispelled rationally and the answer is education and awareness they are the fundamental prerequisites for change and the efforts are sustained required because it is not going to happen overnight the understanding that with technology innovation science globalization and digitalization the idea of superiority is less of physical strength and more of mental strength and the women have immense terrorism and security environment is another challenge for more than decades to my country fortunately pakistan has succeeded in controlling it to a very low level however it has pushed the country into economic further economic instability climate change and environmental disasters like flood of 22 2022 in pakistan has added to the economic crunch and security problems Pakistan has been ranked as one of the top 10 countries most affected by the climate change in the past 20 years with the women being affected the most. The answer is assisting and supporting the government in providing the youth bulge education, training, skills and employment. Pakistan has a has a huge bulge of youth around 60% of the population is less than 30 years of age in mostly living in the marginalized areas these measures will convert them into strength to positively contribute in peace security and development 
The women will also need more relief measures, soft skills, and training to, uh, to engage in economic activities to be the future micro, uh, micro entrepreneurs and financially empowered. Last but not the least, I will talk about regional stability. This is a huge stability, but a must. Peace, security, and economic progress of our country is not possible in an unstable region. For example, we were talking about the situation in Afghanistan. Yes, it has resulted in an influx of refugees and Pakistan hosts about 1.5 million Afghan refugees, making it the world's third largest host country of refugees. Of course, they, uh, they again place a crunch on all kinds of resources, eco including economy. Pakistan and other South uh, countries of South Asia, including Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, Nepal's women are more or less facing similar challenges. And it would be unrealistic to ignore the neighboring countries. I, a woman, ask for regional pleas. We need to join hands regionally and internationally with the policy focus on women's role and decision making in health, education, economics, politics for peace and security. I would conclude it is about gender parity with gender partnership and global partnership for sustained peace and security. And I'm hopeful that such conferences and new initiatives will lead to positive outcomes on the world's women, peace and security. So once again, my gratitude to the organizer, to the Saira, to Madam President, to all of you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will continue with the road of, uh, to leadership in the Malaysian Defense Force. I introduce Brigadier General Patsilat from the Royal Malaysian Air Force. Thank you, sir. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning all. It's indeed an honor to be here. Thank you, ma'am and Dr. Saira for inviting. Okay, for mine, it's more on on my, my journey, because when I was first given the topic, I think back on my uh, tour of duty, I wonder whether I seized any opportunity or did I have to overcome lots of obstacles to be where I am today. The first lady pilot program was a case, for, a case to prove that it would be successful and fruitful, and it has come a long way. Okay. Okay. Malaysia it's a modern country now, but it's still a very conservative country. In fact, in some aspect, it became more conservative than before. 40 years ago, girls in high school were to take home sign where the boys got to do commerce. After the third year, classes are divided into arts and science stream. Guess where most of the girls were? We girls were always told, we reminded, no matter how high we study, we still have to enter the kitchen. Their famous uh, ambition then was to be a teacher. Therefore, after my high school exam, when I got an offer to do TESOL in the US, I was very excited because not only I get to be a teacher, but I got to go to the United States. But suddenly, there was another offer to do engineering under the Armed Forces Scholarship. My father was insistent for me to do engineering over the English. I was scared and underconfident, but I follow my father's wish to see his daughter become an engineer. When I went to the United States in 1982, I knew all the female engineering students in the uni. There was not even 10 of us. Imagine that was in the United States 40 years ago. Doesn't matter, it's in New Jersey, but still. Okay? Upon completion my studies, I was offered to do master's. But my mom told me to come back because she was worried if I have masters, no one would marry me. So I came back and joined the military. I wanted to join the Navy, but there was no lady intake at that time. Then the Air Force offered me the chance to be the first female pilot. Without thinking twice, I straight away said yes. Didn't know anything about pilot at that, at that time. But thanks to Top Gun, I knew <laughs> I made the right decision. At the time when I joined the Air Force, 
there was already graduate officers, but specialized like the doctors and engineers. My batch was the first general duty graduate doing flying course. So not only was I a female, but I was also a graduate and trying to be the first Air Force pilot officer. I had three new things happening at the same time. It was hard. There were a lot of resentment and challenges. But it was a paradigm shift for the Air Force then and after 35 years, I think it works out well. All my graduate or our colleagues opted to leave upon contracted time, but I chose to stay on in the service and seize all the opportunity that was given. As being the first batch lady pilot, lots of restrictions were put on me. I cannot get married until I'm operational. I cannot have children until um, I'm aircraft captain and so on. At that time, maternity leave was only 42 days. So by the time I'm fully uh, uh, operational flying, my son was only three months. Mind you, in my country, uh, culturally, confinement is 100 days. So, and back then, maternity leave is only three times. So that's why I only have three children. It, it has been a long journey. I still remember when I became the best student for my staff college course, the CDF then asked my chief, were there no guys for the course? Imagine, I was happy and proud to win the, the award, but at the same time, hurt and sad. But after 30 years, no one cares, but the record is still there. Both of my one-year courses in Australia and Canada, I went alone without my family. For Australia, at that time, my youngest was only one years old, and my second son was recovering from a major operation. But I chose to go, so I commit myself, and I'm proud to say that I did well. I miss them, but I know I had good support back home. As I was preparing for this presentation and looking back my journey, I realized that I had been given a lot of opportunity and I seized it all. And once I'm committed, I did not look back. If it did not come out as how I wish for, I take it as it was not meant for me. I'm sure there are better plans or reason. And it always does, right? I'm proud that I've inspired young girls and boys, young women and men in my country to dare do out the norm. I always tell them this. Oops. I always tell them this. Be thankful for the people around you because your success is never yours alone. I had my father, husband, bosses and staff to help me. Because of them, I'm smelling like roses to my superior and even my comrade. Second, when there's a decision to make between your career and family, always talk to someone. I'm a Muslim woman, always in dilemma, being a good wife, a mother, but yet I want to serve my country, to be part in upholding the country's sovereignty. Third, always be resilient because you will always have challenges. It always would look like that is the end of the world. But like they say, a woman is like a tea bag. You can't tell how strong she is until you put her into the hot water. Agree? Last but not least, when opportunity comes, always seize it. You will never know where you go from there, no matter how small the opportunities are. Of course, there will always be people who are better than you. You just have to make sure that you are not the last one. You know, people said, oh, sorry. You know, people said, uh, join the Navy to see the world. But I get to see the world because I joined the Air Force. But I have another journey. I, uh, that is my family. Next year, I'll be retiring after serving 38 years. I intend to strengthen the family bond with lots of love and joy and telling my grandchildren lots of story of my wild young days in the service. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we will continue with the Women's Leadership in United Nations missions with Major General Maureen O'Brien from the Irish Army. Um, good morning, everybody, Admiral and um, ladies and gentlemen. How do you follow those? Um, I'm going to sc scrap my speech. I want to do something more entertaining. Um, I joined the Irish Defence Force in 1981. Um, and the reason I did that is because when I left school, uh, there were no women allowed into the Defence Forces. 
So I went to university, got a science degree and then a postgraduate um, diploma in teaching. In fact, I started teaching for three months while I was waiting to hear about my cadetship. Um, so I eventually got the cadetship and, um, but they said they keep the teaching job open for me for a year. I'm still thinking about it. 42 years later. So um, I started off as a cadet at that stage. We were the second class that was what we call integrated. So men and women together, six men, 43 men, uh, six women, 43. Yeah. Um, and still just two have passed away. One man, one woman. Still my best friends and my worst friends, if you know what I mean. You do anything for them. You don't have to love them, though. Not all of them. But especially the women have, uh, the six of us have kept very, very tight. And they have been my support, along with my parents, who said nothing when I said I wanted to join the, the army. I had no idea what the army was about. I knew there was a barracks in the town that I came from. I didn't know the rank structure. I just thought it was going to be a great idea. I was physically fit. I thought I was going to be running and jumping. And uh, yeah, no idea. And it was just that enthusiasm to find out what was next that kept me going and nobody could tell me you can't do it because when I said I wanted to do it I would do it and I would question anybody who stood in my way and that's what I had to do at the very start I actually had to question everything why wasn't I allowed to train recruits well my daughter I wouldn't allow her to do it I said your daughter sir is a civvy I'm a military trained person. So it happened in the end. So it was all about questioning. And, you know, we talk about the sacrifices we made. We've made many sacrifices and they don't go without some impact on you over time. So fast forward, I then, uh, one of the main purposes of the Irish Defence Forces to take part in UN operations. My first UN mission was as a platoon commander in Lebanon in Unifil. I went on to serve there three times. One as a, um, a captain, uh, no, a lieutenant, then as a lieutenant colonel, and again um, as a major and then a lieutenant colonel. We call it commandant. I then went, they were at different times. I served in uh, Western Sahara as an observer. Uh, I went to Untate, which is um, East Timor, Timor-Leste, um, um, with, uh, with the Australian Brigade um, as an operations officer. I went as a deputy battalion commander of the Irish battalion to Chad. And then finally went to um, the Sy Syria, the Golan Heights um, in 2019 as what was then the deputy force commander, but for many, many reasons, including COVID, I was the acting force commander for 11 of those 18 months. I haven't been home since 2019 because I then had an interview to take up the job that I am in at the moment, which is the deputy military advisor in the Office of Military Affairs. The military advisor is to the Under Secretary General for Peace Operations, USA uh, Jean-Pierre Lacroix. This has been extremely challenging, but I'll tell you about Oma, who is responsible, the office is responsible for, um, for, for force generation, planning missions, intelligence gathering, so-called peacekeeping intelligence, um, with a hundred people, with a uh, five-star general in charge, a wonderful man from Senegal, the pilot, won't hold that against him, as an infantry officer, I can't afford to. Um, and I was the first female of the three generals that are there. And it was about time. Because frankly, we are, we are the people who came up with the UN Resolution 132 if we want to increase the number of peace, women in peace operations. So therefore, where, how, does, how do we show that at our UN headquarters? Today, we are 21% women, which is extraordinary. From 42 different nationalities, all regions equally. Uh, represented. It makes for great fun when we talk about our different cultures, but ultimately I'm still ma'am, I'm still the general, and I still have to do the work. I realise I'm a, um, a role model, um, but as I said, I don't get paid to do that. I get paid to do my real work, and that's what I do. Um, I think being a woman in the, in the forces is important to be seen, because if you can't see it, you can't be it. That's how I see it, right? Um, 
And I know that kids who, when it was announced that I was going to the, to the UN, it was celebrated more than I celebrated at home. And um, kids were encouraged by that, which I thought was absolutely wonderful. Because as I said, when I joined, I had nobody as a mentor, no female anywhere as a mentor. Um, so I had to rely on my strength and you build on your strengths. Your uh, disappointments make you stronger and you get determined um, not to let um, defeat get in the way. You keep moving forward. Um, I have always been an advocate of trying to have women in every field in the Defence Forces. And I'm the same with the UN as well. Um, I, I follow what we do in terms of nations ensuring that they are represented by women as well. Is Yes, a lot of people, a lot of troop contributing countries tell us it's not in our culture. I'm sorry, it is in your culture because you took, you actually were part of the UN Resolution 1325 25 years ago, 23 years ago. So yes, it's a law. You must, ob must oblige us. So um, what we do to make TCs do it is that, um, we, first of all, we insist, we embarrass them if they don't do it by telling them they don't have it. And when their permanent representatives, their diplomats um, are meeting USG Le Croix, I'm not a diplomat, so I can say what I no, which is you have very few women represented in your forces. And that kind of embarrassment does work sometimes. Um, also, what we do is the TCCs on the ground, um, the staff officers, their staff officers are 75% must be representative of the TCCs that are on the ground. And if they don't have female, we, females, we cut down the numbers of their staff officers. That hurts. That really hurts. Um, in OMA, what we're doing at the moment, we have two campaigns, um, normally two campaigns for the appointments that we have. We serve as conduct officers for two years, up to three and four um, in exceptional circumstances. And what we do now is we'll see so many, so many nations will say for one job, give us about 10 different or up to 20 different nominations. They don't even do the, you know, the fact checking or give us, or give us their priority. So what we've said now is, yes, you can put in as many names as you like, um, provided 25% are women, qualified women. So it ultimately means that we have less work this year because we know that many of those troop contributing countries will only be able to put three names forward if they don't have a suitably qualified woman. And the crying and the we can't do it. Y yes, you can and you must. So um, it's, thankfully, those positions in the Office of Military Affairs are very so, well sought after. So I think it will change culture. Will it actually make a difference? I think it will, because if they want to have more people considered, it means they have to train the females in, um, you know, do the normal training. Um, the use of engagement platoons, I think this has backfired on us in the United Nations, as I anticipated when it was first came out in 2019. What it has done is had is a tick a box ticking exercise, uh, women have been included in, and without any training, just because you are a female, you're put into an engagement platoon. We have changed our policy. The policy in our is now that it is an engagement platoon. It must have men and women. So there must be a course. They must undergo do a course. You are not an engagement team simply because you're a woman. As my thesis says about UN resolution, which I could talk about much more, UN resolution 1325, a recipe for stereotyping uh, just at women and stir, recipe for gender stereotyping in the Irish Defence Forces as it was. So that's my journey. I'm looking forward to answering questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I think that you, I saw the faces, you enjoy the, the presentations. Uh, we are in the Navy. So um, as young officer or midshipman, you began to recognize the signals, no? And I will ask, which one is this? Charlie, no? The C. So for me, it's a magical letter. Why? Because that represents courage, commitment, and cooperation. So I think that that is the key. And I talk always with my crew at the Naval World College in Peru. I will put the Charlie flag over each top of the office because uh, we need to have in mind always that three, courage. And I think that these three ladies represent the courage of 
a long journey that set the path for the future leaders, not only in, in their own countries, also in the world.